Hello, welcome back to my space. I know you have enjoyed the teaching on fasting and last week we talked about hearing God speak. Today we are going to talk about the pasture of God's word. Remember we said last week that you are supposed to be his sheep and he's supposed to know you as his sheep. And we also say that one of the ways that you function as his sheep is by eating his pasture. David says in Psalm 23 that he leads me beside still quiet waters and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When he says the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He talks about he leadeth me. He leads him. He leads him beside still quiet pastures. He takes him to the waters. He takes him to the pastures. So are you eating enough pasture? Because maybe the reason why you're not able to hear the spirit of the Lord on the inside of you is there isn't enough God on the inside of you. Because if God is speaking from inside you, there has to be enough God inside you so that you can hear that God bubbling up and coming up and bubbling up to eternal life. So today I want to talk about reading God's word, reading it in a way that is enjoyable, reading it in a way that is understandable, reading it in a way that is easy for you to remember. I have noted that for most of us, even for our own children, most of us don't know how to read the word of God. And therefore, we find it boring. And because we find it boring, therefore, then when God speaks, we've never heard about the thing. When someone comes up with a certain scripture, you're thinking, oh, my God, where did they get that scripture? And so I thought that we need to stop and we need to learn how to read the word of God and eat it like Jeremiah did and enjoy it because, yes. Yes, the word of God is enjoyable. Now, one of the things I want us to know is the nature of every kingdom is that it has laws, it has rules, it has procedure, it has secrets. Okay? Every kingdom has those things. They are things that are written down that are the tenets of that kingdom. And so if you are going to be a part of that kingdom and you're going to be a very good and useful part of the kingdom, you need to know those things so that then as you apply those things, you become the kind of kingdom citizen that the king dreams about. So it means that if you are going to be a subject that is going to be under the rule of that kingdom, then you need to know the rule of the law of that kingdom. I want us to go into the word and I want us to read certain scriptures. Let us read Psalm 138. Psalm 138 and verse 2. It says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. You have magnified your word above all your name. The name of the Lord is the rule of the kingdom. The word of the Lord is the rule of the kingdom that has been magnified. It is the one that has been made bigger than anything else. The name of Jesus, because that is the name by which every man can be saved. But the word of the Lord, which is living and active, which is sharper than a two-edged sword, which penetrates to dividing bone and marrow, soul and spirit which judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The Bible says in Psalm 19, and these are some of my sweetest, sweetest Psalms, especially when I'm talking about the word of God and how sweet the word of God is. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. If you want to be wise, simple Eunice, it is written in the word of God. If you want to be converted from the quarrelsome woman to a woman who is temperate of a temperate spirit, from a person who is ingesting all this porn to a person who is in purity, from a person who is struggling with the spirit of poverty to a person who is living in abundance, from a person who prays for 10 minutes to a person who prays for one hour. The Bible is saying that this testimony converts, it changes, it makes you move from one level to the next, it changes you. 
it converts. The Bible says in verse 8 of 19 Psalms, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Is anybody sad? If you are sad, the only way for you to have a heart that is rejoicing is in the statutes of God. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And listen to this. The judgments of the Lord are true and altogether righteous. More to be desired than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and than the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. You are warned, and then there is great reward. So why are we not able to read this kind of the word of God? Let us also read the scripture in Proverbs. That is also another favorite one. You've heard me say it here on this channel over and over again. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 22. The Bible says, the Oh, let me start from um, verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Why? For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. You hear that? They are life to all who find them and health to all their flesh. This is life. This is health to all our flesh. So why then are we not taking in the word? The one that is going to make our eyes enlightened. The one that is going to give health to our flesh. The one that is going to revive the soul. The one that is going to, de 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 uh, de to purify our hearts. The one that is going to make wise the simple. It is because we do not know how to read it. Now, let me tell you. Some of the things that you need to consider if you are going to get into the word of God and you're going to enjoy it. Number one, go to the pastures daily. Plan on eating daily. There are many things we can fast of, but this is not to be fasted. If you are going to be sheep that is healthy, the way God created his word is that that word must be eaten every day. Let me tell you something that I've learned to understand from God's word. When we are born in sin, our bodies only know sin. That is why the apostle said that I don't understand myself. The good things I want to do, I don't do. The bad things I don't want to do, I do. And then he said, woe unto me. But let me tell you something. The Canaanites who are like the sin in your life, they are taken little by little out of you as you read the word. It is the same principle when it comes to healing. When you are sick and then you keep on reading God's word and hearing the word of God, a point reaches where the body is saturated with the word. You reach a saturation limit. So this word produces life like that. So are you suffering in your body? Are there things you are suffering that you're failing to break free from? Take in as much. Take a little time every day. When God told the children of Israel to go to Canaan, he told them that I will not drive out all the tribes ahead of you at once. Because if I do, the giants in the land will devour you. The wild animals will devour you because the land will be empty. But then he promised them, he said, little by little, I will get rid of them. That is exactly what the word of God does. Incremental volumes. Little by little. I didn't start out the way I am. I didn't start out knowing God. I didn't start out knowing him deeply. I didn't start out praying for two hours, three hours, one hour, 40 minutes. But as I kept on going to the pastures every day, drinking of the water of the word, eating of the pasture of the word, little by little, the Canaanite of disobedience in my land started to die. The tiredness started to die. The desire not to fight started to die and was replaced with a desire to fight. So number one, I want to tell you, go to the pastures daily. Let God find you in the pasture of his word every single day. You will see the deliverance of God. The second thing, keep a journal. Keep a journal. Write it down. 
Proverbs chapter 4, 20 has said, keep attention to the words, incline our ear to the word. But it has said, do not depart, let them not depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart. How are you going to do that? How is it not going to depart from your eyes? Look at it, but write it down. So that even when you're not looking at this, which was already written down, you have something that you have written down. One of the things I do is I draw pictures out of the word of God. One of the ways that I understood the tabernacle of the Mosai and I understood the ark of the covenant and I understood the holy place, the most holy place and the holy of holies is, as I read it, I drew it. One of the ways that I understood the priestly robe, like right now when I see reverence of the uncle church and whatever, I understand why the bishop put on a certain thing why on his cassock there are certain things is because i took time and i drew it i learned to draw the pictures and as you write these things down they will get written on your heart number three pray over the word what do i mean when you are going to read the word of god i don't want you to remember the words uh, to forget i don't want you to forget the words of john 16 the holy spirit is our teacher never get into this word without asking the holy spirit to come as soon as you say i am now going to read the word of god say spirit of the living god come you are the teacher first of all the spirit of the living god is the finger the author that wrote this word so it means that he knows even the things he deliberately hid. So it means that when you invite him, he's going to even tell you the things that he deliberately hid, that he is looking for those who are coming closer to be told. The Bible says that he only tells you what he has heard from the Father. So don't get into the word of God without inviting the Holy Spirit. Number four, have reverence for the word of God. Children of God, have you considered that this word that I'm opening like this is God himself? Do you fear this word? When you pick up this word to read it, what goes on in your mind? Because let me tell you something. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, through whom who? The word. Through the word who? God. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Without this word, even me, I'm part of nothing. Even you, you're part of nothing. Everything that we see and everything we don't see, it was made by the word. This means that this is such a rich treasury. The Bible says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. This was the life. This is life. You know, one of the things I do these days when I'm praying, I thank God for life. Because I've realized we can pay our way for anything, but we can't pay our way for life. When the time has come, you can't offer anymore. Now, the Bible is telling us that perhaps what you can offer is this in this is life when you see the word of god children of god revere it hold this as sacred as possible that is why if in this one it says do not let your heart be troubled it means don't even allow don't fall for it don't consider it else you are disobeying this this is god this is God. So when you're reading it, read it with reverence. Read it with the understanding that this is God. Open your eyes wide. The Bible says that I'm the Lord your God. Open your mouth wide that I will feed you. When we come to the pasture of God's word, let our mouths go as wide as they can be so that we can ingest as much God as we can. Number five, ask questions. Ask God when. Ask yourself when. When was this written? Do you know that there are many people who read the Psalms and they actually think that all of them were written by David? There are many people who read the Psalms and they don't even know at what point they were written. Do you know that in here in the Psalms there is even uh, Psalms that were written by Moses? Like that Psalm we like to say, teach me to number my days. Teach me to number my days. 
that I may write that I may hate, get a heart of wisdom. It was written by Moses. Some of these Psalms were written by Moses. Some of them were written by Asaph. Now, when you read and it's written by Asaph, ask questions and say, who is Asaph? Don't just be comfortable reading and then when the Bible says Selah, before anyone tells you that Selah means stop, them, see, uh, think, uh, think calmly about it, ask yourself, what is the meaning of Selah? I usually tell my children that these are some of the questions you ask when you read the word. Who was this written to? Who was Colossians written to? What were their circumstances? Where were they living? Why did they write to them that, chap that verse, that book? And then you ask yourself, so what is the difference between me and these people? Or what is the similarity between me and these people? That is how you're going to relate to the word. I usually ask myself, where else is this scripture written? Or where else is something that looks like this written in God's word? Ask some questions. Some of them, the answers are in the word itself. I go to Google and I say, how many verses talk about numbering days? All right. And then Google will tell me how many they are. That is asking questions to see where else and then all you say, who wrote this psalm? Or you say, why was Moses asking God to number his days aright? And then when you get that explanation, it will give you a deeper understanding of the word of God. So ask questions. Ask questions like when, why, how, where else, what next, what before? Because you can read a scripture and then it says, therefore, because of this, Ask yourself, because of what? If you started at chapter 8 and chapter 8 was saying that, then go back to chapter 7 and not the because. That is, what it is, that is what we call studying the word of God. Number six, research the word. Research the word of God. And I'm going to come back to that because I want, to do us, I want us to do a certain study of the word today. For us to understand certain things. But when you research, it means you ask, what is the meaning of these words? You ask, where else were these words used? Why did they choose these words? I remember when I was growing up, I used to read the Psalms. I loved the Psalms. And then I used to read. David says, as I pass through the valley of Baca, as he passes through the valley of Baca, he makes it a place of streams. And then I said, what is the valley of Baca? What does it look like? And the beauty is that these days, even when you go to Pinterest and you say Valley of Baca, you will even see pictorial interpretations of that valley. When you see the Valley of Baca and you see how dry it is, and then they say that those who dwell in the house of the Lord are so blessed, they are ever praising God, that when they go through the Valley of Baca, they turn it into a place of streams. Then you're like, what? As a person who praises God, this is how I light up desert places. Then you will praise the Lord some more. I used to read David saying, it's like the cedars of Lebanon. I said, what is a cedar? I usually just go on Google and I say, pictures of a cedar. And then I say, what are the characteristics of cedars? And then I say, why were they insisting that the temples must be built with cedars? <laughs> and then one day I realized, that out of a cedar comes a very good oil. That is a healing oil. It's a healing balm. First of all, when you use a cedar in your house, actually me, if I had access to cedars, it is what I would use in my house. And then I would leave them, you know, I wouldn't put plaster on them and stuff like that. Because when you research about the cedar, it says that it has healing properties. And the older it gets, the more the properties grow. So the reason why God used to insist that the temples are built with cedars is that when people got into the temple, they got into a place of healing. Not only through listening to the word, but even the air they are breathing in. Because the cedar will infiltrate the entire atmosphere with its fragrance. And therefore, when I'm praying for my children, I can say, may they grow to be like the cedars of Lebanon. I'm praying it with understanding. I'm saying, may they go out and may they, in, may they release a fragrance in their community. Wow. When I read, and the Bible says, for example, in the book of Joshua, the Bible says that all these things, aren't they written in the book of Joshua? I stop and I say, what is the book of Joshua? Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that the book of Joshua is actually there? 
It is there in print and it is there online. That book of Jasher, J-A-S-H-E-R, it is written in the Bible. The book of Jasher is found in Joshua chapter 10 verse 13 and in 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 18. They refer to it. Hmm? And when you read the book of Jasher, you're going to know Abraham's history. You know, it's like a storybook. Those of you who have babies, these are the stories you need to read for your babies instead of Mr. Hare. The hare, the lion, the elephant. You can read for them because there are stories behind this Bible. This is the compact version. When you read the books of kings and judges and then they say, ah, the rest of these things are written in the annals of history of so and so. They are written in the book of kings. Go and research that book. I got to know that actually Abraham ran away from, was banished from his family. And that is how he ended up in Lot's family. Because his father used to worship the stars. And then when Abraham started to seek God and seek him deeper, he started to question, he started to say, but there has to be a person who created this thing we, 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 we worship. Because they used to worship stars. And that is how Abraham ended up in Lot's family. And that is how God started to love Abraham. Now when you start to know those things, you will understand the evil of idolatry from a whole different perspective. Research the word of God. Read different versions. You have seen me. When I am teaching you God's word, I open different versions of the word. I will always say, what does the Passion Translation say? What does the Good News Bible say? What does the NIV say? What does this say? I want to know what the different versions of the Bible say. Why? Because every version brings out the nature of God's word differently. And sometimes when the good news is not speaking, the KJV will speak, the Amplified will speak. Read it in as many versions and read it in as many languages. That is why I like the U version Bible here on my phone. Because I can read it in Lusoga. I can read it in Luganda. I can read it in English. I can read it in Runyankole. I can read it in Kiswahili. Every language that I have a little bit of understanding about, I like to read it in the word. Like I will tell you the first time I read that scripture in Romans that says, in all these things we are more than conquerors. The first time I read it in Luganda is the first time I understood the meaning. Because Luganda says, Tuliba wangu zinokuchirao. It means that we are already conquerors. We start out as conquerors. And then we become more. So Tuliba wangu zinokusingao, meaning we are already conquerors and we surpass being conquerors. That is the first time I understood the meaning of, ah. Oh. That is what the Bible means by we are more than. Because before I read it in the Luganda, I wasn't understanding the meaning of more than. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors. Read as many versions as possible. The Bible tells us in Psalm 16, and I want to read it in different versions to just illustrate. And I will open my U version Bible. Psalm 16 uh, verse... Five to six, and I will tell you how I applied that in prayer the day I understood it. So Psalm 16, verse five to six, in the NIV says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Okay? Passion translation says, Yahweh, you alone are my inheritance. Now, when you read a word like that, you want to first do some research on the word inheritance because some of you, maybe your father's passed on and left nothing or they've not passed on so you don't understand the meaning of inheritance. You will only understand certain things when you research them. You are my prize. Meaning, when I win in this world, <laughs> the prize I am given, the, the thing that makes me a winner is not my gift and talent. God is my prize. You're my pleasure and my portion. You hold my destiny and its timing is in your hands. So I can go to God and I can say, my destiny and its timing is in your hands. Now you can turn back the clock of my destiny. Your pleasant path leads me to pleasant places. I'm overwhelmed by the privileges that come with following you. 
Listen to the message Bible. My choice is you, God. First and only. And now I find I'm your choice. You set me up with a house and a yard. <laughs> and then you make me your heir. Wow. My choice is you. And then you're my choice. And I'm your choice. You set me up with a house and a yard. And then you make me your heir. I love that. But listen to the Luganda. Mukama. Gwe mugabu gwange. Gwe nonze. Guho kume yange. Bionabi ompa debi runji. Mazimo mugabu gwange. Murunji dara. Let me tell you what happened to me the, way I read, the day I read that verse. I had never thought about reading, uh, praying it as a business person. But one day I read it. I read it again. I said, Gwe mugabu gwange. Gwe gwe nonze. Gwe kume yange. I was going through a rough time where I used to have social media wars. I would go on social media and someone would ask, I want outside catering, who, who delivers and whatever, and people would punch in my name. And my competitors would get into the inbox of the people who, were, who had been given my number. And they would say, she's like this, they would mad sling me. And so I was beginning to say, my God, what is the section of the market that belongs to me? Who am I going to serve? What am I going to do? How am I going to fight with my competition? And then one beautiful morning, I read that verse in Luganda. And you know what I did? I knelt down and I said, Lord, you are my portion. When the whole of Kampala is being dissected and sized, and they are apportioning customers, the customer I have chosen is God. When the whole of Kampala is being stirred up, and they are giving out workers. The worker I have chosen is called God. When the marketing is being done all over Kampala, all over Uganda, and when the market walk goes up, Rika Satayaba, the one I have chosen is God. Mukama gwe mugabo gwange. And then I started to draw pictures in my mind. You see, those of us who grew up in the older times, they used to give us food kurujuliro together. We would all be seated together. And then mommy would pick a piece and put for someone, ngaugo gwe mugabugo, that's your portion. And then they would pick and then they would put. Those of you who grew up like my children, where you picked your portion, you may not understand, but now you can even understand because we pimirako. For me, when I got into the marketplace, I am not like you. The portion I chose is called Jesus. So when I stand and I sing that song, the Lord is my portion in the land of the living, I understand it better. The portion of the market in this world that I chose is God. So even when I'm training my staff on how to treat customers, yes, sometimes they get it wrong. But like how we also get it wrong, how we treat God. But I tell them, guys, everybody who is entering this place is God. So you who is my EK customer, I want to tell you that to me, you are God. Because the portion of the market that I have chosen, Omugamo Gwena Jakuru Juliro is called God. So when they pick up a portion and give it to me, that portion is God. So they used to give each one of us a portion. And then they would give each one of, of you your meat. And some people would hold it in one hand because they don't want it to be taken away. Some people would hide it under the matoke. And then they would start to eat. But let me tell you something, people. If they put that food on plates and they called all of you and they said, pick, what would you pick? We all always went for the biggest portion. Or we went for the juicest portion. Or we went for the one that had the biggest piece of meat. Or we went for the one that had the biggest piece of chicken. Because everybody wants a good portion. Business person I want to teach you today. Choose Jesus. Choose him as my portion. Even when I'm praying for customers, I say, Father, what have we done wrong? Why aren't you coming anymore? When we hurt a customer, it is to God I go to and I say, Lord, I'm so sorry. There was a time in Ike when it was okay for my staff to discuss a customer. It is not okay anymore. Even the worst mannered customer who walks in, I tell them, you know something? I don't know what happened to God today, but we are not going to gossip about God. I don't allow them. I don't allow derogatory remarks about the customer. Yes, once in a while you find yourself saying things, that, but I go to God and I say, Lord, you're the one I chose. I picked you up. When they 
gave the portions of the market when everybody is fighting and fighting and cajoling. I looked and I said, the other one is my portion. You're the one who keeps what belongs to me. You are my portion. You are my pleasure. You hold my destiny in your hands. That New Living Translation says, you guard all that is mine. <laughs> He's not only the one that I chose to serve, but he's the God. <laughs> he is the one I have chosen out of the many. And he's the one who guards. So when people are stealing from my business, so when people are coming in to monitor me, so when people are treating me bad, I say, Gwe Akuma, Ebiang. You're the one who maintains my lot. Hmm? The Amplified says, you hold and maintain there was a time when refrigerators were always down in Ike. We repaired ice cream machines until I said, but Lord, you are the one who maintains my lot. There was a time we had power issues in one of our locations. Power surges, making our machines fail. I said, but Lord, you maintain my lot. There was a time when we had an issue in one of our locations. People were stealing and I said, Lord, you maintain my lot. He is my portion in the land of the living. Read different versions. Read different languages. Pay attention to the cross references. The Bible says there are over 340,000 cross references in the Bible. A cross reference is where they say something and it is referred to in another portion and it was talked about in another portion or it was inferred in another portion. Actually, Psalms 110, where the Bible says that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make the enemy your footstool. It's, it is written that it is the most cross-referenced verse in the Bible, the most cross-referenced chapter. When you read, that's why I like to read the Amplified Bible. If you read the Bible hmm, and they put in brackets that it is also written in Isaiah, stop right there, open Isaiah and see how it is written in Isaiah and see the circumstances under which it is written. Because when you read it like that, you will understand the context better. You will have your Bible study time longer and richer and deeper. See the different patterns. When the Bible says in Psalm 125, verse 1 to 2, that they that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion that will never move, be moved. I want you to think about Mount Zion. I want to th you to think about something that is immovable. Hmm? It says they are like Mount Zion which cannot be moved and abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. So you need to think about, maybe you need to get pictures of Jerusalem and see the mountains that surround Jerusalem. So you go and say, which mountains are surrounding Jerusalem? How do those mountains look like? Then you say, oh my God, this is how God is surrounding me. Draw a tiny picture of Eunice in the middle and let that be Jerusalem. And draw all the mountains around her. Believe you me, fear will, will go. People who know my WhatsApp um, profile, they know that there is a verse I love very much that I put on my WhatsApp. The Bible says that I will not fear <laughs> even though the mountains are moved. Even if the mountain moves and goes and falls into the sea. That is what David said. Do you know the mind picture I drew? It is what is on my WhatsApp status. And I put that status during COVID. There was a lot of fear mongering going on around. It was moving all over the place. And this is what I wrote on my WhatsApp status. And it is there up to today. I said, even if Mountain Renzori comes catwalking past the window of my bedroom, I shall not fear. Because for me, that is the picture that I put. As like, <laughs> by the time it comes walking slowly and catwalking past my window, it is what they call Vitabusi. But as like, even if Mountain Renzo removes, hmm, and it comes cat walking past my window on its way to falling in the Indian Ocean, I, Eunice Negagadwango, I will not be moved. And I see that every day. Many people who saw that status, actually one of my pastors saw it and said, Eunice, you're very funny. But I do one thing. I see patterns in the scriptures, and I also see where these things are written 
in the other in the other parts of the bible and i draw mind pictures like i told you the reason why i understand the tabernacle and the place of prayer from the outer court into the holy of holies is because i have drawn it like a picture on a paper i draw but i want us even as we go towards closing this session i want us to go through some study of the bible some practical studies of the Bible. We will delve into this more, not next week, but another time. And I will, I will, you know, every other time maybe I will do, I will do a some Bible study series at some point. But I want us to read Matthew chapter 2. Okay? And I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation, no special reason. So the Bible says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, near Jerusalem, during the reign of King Herod, after Jesus, sorry, during the reign of King Herod, after Jesus' birth, a group of spiritual priests from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, when you read that verse and you leave it there like that, and you don't do any researches, why Bethlehem? What is special about Bethlehem? Why Jerusalem? What is special about Jerusalem? Who are spiritual priests or magi? If you do not do any research, your study won't be richer. Now, let me tell you something I found out about spiritual priests, okay? This is what the Bible says. Spiritual priests are astrologers. So you're going to find that other versions of the Bible calls them astrologers. Now, if you read that it's astrologers, stop there and find out who an astrologer is. Don't read the Bible as if you're reading a history book. The Bible, now, this is what is in the concordance, the Bible dictionary. It says, these wealthy priests, so the astrologers, the magi, the wise men, were wealthy priests. They would have traveled with an entourage for protection as officials from the East. Let me tell you, the first time I read this in the Concordance, the first time I researched this, when I realized that the wise men were not only three. They, are, they were wealthy. They came as an entourage. That is why the Bible says, when they sang glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth, the voices were loud that they were heard across the hills. It wasn't only three men singing. But because in our Christmas plays, it's always we three kings, we think that they were only three. Continue listening to this. The Greek word megos is taken from the Medi language and means spiritual advisors or simply priests. They were appointed by Darius over the state religion as priests of Persia. So these guys came from the reign of Darius. By the time of Jesus' birth, Persia had been conquered and was being governed by successors to Alexander the Great. It is possible that this Magi came from the Mesopotamia region of Seleucia. And if you are reading the Bible, there is another place where Seleucia is actually mentioned. See also Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel 5.11, where the prophet Daniel is given the type of chief of the Magi. Wow. The day I realized this, I was like, what? These guys were people of the Daniel company. So every time I'm studying Daniel, I look at the things Daniel does and I see the characteristics between Daniel and the three wise men. So these guys had studied stars. When you read the book of Daniel and you read about Daniel, he also knew how to interpret stars. They continue. It's probable that these Magos were descendants of those who had been taught by Daniel. And because of his prophecy of the Messiah being cut off, they may have been able to decipher the date of the birth of Jesus along with the interpretation of the star rising. So it was not a coincidence. These guys were not just seeing stars and said, eh, no. They knew prophecy. Do you know what that shows me? Eunice, follow prophecy. Eunice, put your, your finger on the prophecies. And I'm not talking these prophecies where you can tell that my chair is green. That's not what I'm talking about. So for me, when I see a deep, rich prophetic ministry, when I see prophecies in the Bible, I follow them because they will lead me somewhere. Now, let me tell you something else that I saw in that verse, in that word, okay? Um, I've told you these people were traveling in a group. Now, I want to show you something else that was shocking for me when I studied, and I'm going to go to verse 11. The Bible says, when they came into the house and they saw the child with Mary, 
his mother, they fell to the ground at his feet and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests full of gifts presented with and presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Afterward, they returned to their own country by another roof because God had warned them in a dream not to go back to Herald. I told you God speaks in dreams. Now listen to something that changed the way I bring offerings in the presence of God. I don't need a sermon because I studied this. Listen, we heard that the wise men were extremely wealthy. Listen to this Bible interpretation and concordance. They presented gifts that totaled a great sum of money, not tiny presents wrapped with boughs, but treasure chests full of financial wealth. Let me tell you, child of God, many of us have received Jesus as a baby. And therefore, even when we are bringing gifts, we bring gifts to baby Jesus. We bring little boxes with boughs. These men brought treasure chests full of financial wealth. Listen, although we are not given the monetary value of each type of gift, we know that frankincense and myrrh were extremely costly. These gifts would have financed Joseph and Mary and jo Jesus' exodus to Egypt and supplied their living ex expenses for a number of years, even after returning to Israel. Gold is often used as a symbol of the deity of Christ. Frankincense, post points to his perfect life of holiness, excellence, and devotion. Mar, an embleming spice, speaks to us of the suffering love that would lead him to the cross. Can you imagine? In the type of gifts these people brought to Jesus, spoke into his death, spoke into his resurrection and becoming the soon coming king, and they spoke into his perfect holiness. So the gold is talking about the risen, glorified Jesus. The frankincense is talking about the holiness of Jesus. The mar is talking about the death and the resurrection of our Lord. And we have heard that the gifts they gave lasted Jesus a lifetime. That is why Jesus was a very rich man. So these people at birth, they didn't bring diapers. You see, because we go for baby showers and you take bibs, you think that in the wise man's chest were bibs. This has informed how I give people I care about gifts. The people I deeply care about and the people I deeply honor and revere, I give them real good gifts. But also, I am careful about the meaning of a gift. Finally, the way I bring offering to Jesus. <laughs> Let me tell you, the, the, the time I studied this changed the kind of offering I go with in the presence of God, especially at Christmas time. Children of God, we are not offering to babies. You see, if, if Jesus is in, your, is in your laps like this, like for you when you're looking at Jesus, he fits only here. The kind of gift you'll bring to Jesus is the kind that you give to one who fits here. But if you're the wise men, the Bible says that they, were, they had exceedingly great joy. You know why? Because they had been looking for this one. The prophecy had tarried for a long period of time. Do you know that's parable of the one who found the, the one sheep or the one of the lost coin? The one who found the lost coin hid it so far <laughs> because of the exceeding joy. I have taken time and I have told you that if you take time, and you get the Bible dictionary. You get the concordance. There are so many Bible dictionaries online. Strong's dictionary is one of those, the best that I know. I read it. I ask, what's the meaning of mar? How much is mar? How would it cost? In present day life, what would it symbolize? You will be amazed at the things you find out. So when I stand in the presence of God and I say, Lord, Silver and gold I do not have. I understand what I'm talking about because I will never be able to give Jesus a gift that finances his entire lifetime. When I stand in his presence and I say, Lord, I cannot give you enough. I understand the meaning of I cannot give you enough. But if you don't understand that, because you sang a beautiful song and everybody clapped for you, because you did a video like this and you got 2,000 likes, you start thinking God cannot do without you. 
and you know what is going to happen? You're going to develop pride. Because you really think that he can't do without you. But we can never give enough. Imagine even those wise men after giving like that. It was never enough. Children of God, when you get into the word of God, I will teach you another time how to read it step by step. But today I wanted us to start to find joy in reading God's word. I keep telling my children, the Bible says when you pass through the Negev, I tell them find out what does the Negev look like. Look for pictures of the Negev. I remember I usually put this on my WhatsApp status and one day I put pictures of the Negev and, the, and I, I put the streams in the Negev. And someone got in my inbox and said, are you sure? Oh my God, this is how it looks like. When you can get the picture, you will understand it better and you will pray it better. Now, are you going to go and eat? <laughs> are you going to eat some? Because I can guarantee you it is extremely tasty. It is sweeter <laughs> than honey. It is living. It is active. You know, I had to research what a two-edged sword means, a double-edged sword, and I had to get a picture. And I realized that the way double-edged sword works, eh? you see, our swords, which are one side, when you cut, you cut like that and remove and cut. And chances are that you would not go into the same cut. Okay? Now, a double-edged sword, when I do this, I turn and I do that. And I turn and I do this. And I turn and I do that. And I turn and I do that. It destroys. Because it is sharp on every side. <laughs> there was a time I read a scripture where David said, I have set my eyes on you like flint. I went and I researched what flint is. My God, it is a sharp stone, eh? very sharp. I said, Lord, teach me how to set my eyes on you like flint. Reza sharp sigajao. So that when you turn, I know you've turned. When you cough, I know you've coughed. When you stand, I know you've stood. Because I understood what it means to set my eyes on him like flint. Until next time, you can imagine I want to go on and on. Because I have so many juxtapositions of the word of God. But I hope you will get in and you will start to eat the pasture of God's word. Until next time, Eunice Adubango here in my space. When we come back, we are going to start talking about spiritual Warfare. Yes. Bye-bye.